Hello, everybody. Just a second. I, I just realized I need to get rid of my chewing gum. Just a second. Can I just get it here? Yeah. No, no, I'll do it. <laughs> right. Because uh, you don't want to see me choking on stage or spitting it in the front row. Uh, it's amazing to be here. It actually feels really good. Uh, not least because it's much warmer and dry here than outside. Uh, and I have to warn you uh, straight away that uh, I tend to speak way too fast whenever I'm under pressure. So feel free to interrupt me, feel free to uh, make whistles, throw stuff on stage, if you feel that I'm pronouncing some sort of Russian gibberish with a very heavy accent. Um, so to begin with, uh, Andres asked me to share something personal with you. And uh, so here I am, my name is Igor Zinatovin, I'm 30, I'm Scorpio. Uh, I support uh, Zenit Football Club, which sounds like a terrible joke here in Barcelona. Uh, and I'm kind of obsessed with sci-fi books and dash hound dogs. Uh, on top of that, in the last 15 years, I've been involved in the media industry, which started, uh, well, 15 years ago, from a moment when uh, my former classmate and I launched uh, an embarrassing music show about some obscure local bands uh, for a pirate radio station in St. Petersburg. And it was shut down two months after, uh, because we weren't able to properly use uh, radio equipment. We would burn all the CDs at home and then they will be skipping all the time, so we had to play the same track again and again and again, and it kind of pissed people off. But anyway, it was a long time ago, and um, in the last three years, I've been involved in a project which is called Cover 22 Foundation in London, and I'm going to talk about it a bit later. But first of all, I'd like you to take part in a very simple geographical quiz. So how many people in this room have been to or have heard of a place which is called Ulan Ude? Here we go. Right. Uh, does, it, does it just ring the bell for anyone else? Well, not, not quite a sea of hands out there, uh, which is exactly how I expected. Uh, and there is nothing to worry about because I didn't know much about Ulanda either, at least until very recently. So to give you a, a visual hint, Ulanda is painfully far from here, from Barcelona. It's a little town lost somewhere in the dusty steppes of southern Siberia, not far from the border with Mongolia. Uh, if, you think that, if you think that the weather out there is extreme, try surviving a winter in Ulanade, because in the winter time, it gets so cold. Where was the pretty winter picture? Anyway, it's lost. In the winter, it gets so cold that you, uh, that without a, fur, a proper fur hat, your, eyes, your, uh, your hair will turn into icicles in less than five minutes. And in the summertime, it doesn't get much better. Uh, sorry, that's another image anyway. Uh, in the summertime, it doesn't get much better because uh, the whole city prepares for a major invasion of giant mosquitoes from China. Uh, and the city, architecture-wise, is probably well known for one fact, is that uh, it accommodates the largest uh, head of Lenin which has been ever built on a planet. So that's quite an achievement. And try to compare this to La Sagrada Familia. Uh, and also, if you ever want to go out there, just be prepared that you need to spend at least 96 hours together from Moscow on a sleeper train, which looked like, like that approximately. Uh, so if, if, it, it, it's an interesting place, it's a fascinating place. But what's even more fascinating about Ulanode is that actually, in terms of local creative economy, it's very similar to a very different city, which is called Los Angeles. Just like Los Angeles, Ulanode is home to a thriving, burgeoning film industry. It's, it, it's surprising, but it's, it's actually, it's a fact. Uh, just like Los Angeles, um, Ulanode has a sizable chunk of local population which is involved in the motion picture sector. Uh, this tiny town produces dozens of feature films annually, and uh, every Buratian kid wants to be like this guy called Bayer Dishanov. This is local film director whose uh, feature called A Buddha Smile uh, received a crystal bear at the Berlin Film Festival in 2009. And that's another film director you've already seen. His name is Salomon Ligboev. And he kind of makes a point that you, you'd better watch his next movie, otherwise you never know what happens. Um, so why are we talking about Ulan Ude? And uh, why the hell we brought up this topic at all? Uh, well, I think that this is really important and it's very timely because it shows what a profound impact internet has produced on places like Ulan Ude and many other remote corners of the world. Uh, instead of spreading uh, 
waves of cultural homogenization as it is commonly perceived, it has actually empowered and liberated local talents and equipped people like Barry Dushanov with all the necessary skills and knowledge uh, to be able to make something uh, original, yet universally understandable, to make something really ambitious and big, to shake up the entire world from its furthest corners. And that is the main inspiration for COVID-22 Foundation, a project which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so COVID-22 was started in 2009 as a cultural space in East London. Um, we, uh, the, the main mission of the space is to showcase contemporary artists from Russia and Eastern Europe. The region which is often, um, which is often misunderstood and uh, underrepresented. The region which is usually described with many uns, it's unrelated, it's, uh, it's uh, unusual, it's unfamiliar, it's untapped. Well, we thought that it wasn't all that unusual and it was actually closely related to the global art scene. And that's why we've conducted more than 25 major exhibitions of contemporary artists from Russia, Poland, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, uh, Slovenia, and many other countries that share the same burden of troubled history and uncertain future. Uh, so the exhibitions were great and we were getting extremely positive feedback from the journalists and from the audiences. But at the same time, we realized that with the art shows, we were barely scratching the surface of this rich and immensely diverse territory. So to solve this problem and to broaden up our scope, we decided to launch an online platform, which is called the Cover Journal, which is the world's first English-speaking uh, project covering creativity from the former Eastern Bloc. Have a look at the uh, homepage of the project. Uh, well, we did it because we were tired and we were bored with the same good old cliches and one-dimensional stories that were disseminated by the mainstream media. And we simply wanted to splash some colors on this largely black and white coverage of the um, uh, of stuff happening behind the Iron Curtain. Uh, and when we started the project, we were mainly driven by pure enthusiasm. We were inspired by works of artists and designers and architects that we knew personally, but we couldn't even imagine what kind of exciting discoveries we were going to make along the way. Because the further we ventured, right, uh, that's another story, just, just, just to say, this, is, this was a story about the street football uh, that we published in collaboration with Nike. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be there, but anyway. But the further, the further we ventured outside of the large capital cities, the more original, the more inspiring, the more surprising, the more thought-provoking our findings were. And we made them with the help of hundreds of contributors, which were stationed across all the ten, ten time zones of the country, uh, who were simply bombarding us with ideas and insights and uh, some astonishing uh, findings. Uh, that were distributed with us via social media and bloggers' networks. And this wouldn't be possible even five years ago because we simply have just five, we simply have two dedicated uh, editors who manage the entire network. Uh, so, peeling off layer by layer, we discovered the whole new world of hidden creativity, which is, lies almost invisible to the vast majority of people around the world. Uh, and just to illustrate this point, I want to show you uh, a few stories that we published on the cover journal. Uh, in the last few months. So the first one will take us to uh, a lovely place which is called Norilsk. Uh, I think the title is pretty much self-explanatory. Extreme cold, check. Acid rain, check. So why do locals love the Arctic city of Norilsk? This is the, ans this is the question which has no, uh, no meaningful answer. We still haven't found it yet. But what we've discovered is that this merciless place, which is mainly well known for two reasons. Firstly, it's the second largest city inside the Arctic Circle. I mean, you can literally walk from there to the North Pole, to the North Pole in the winter time. And secondly, it's uh, as far as I understand, it's uh, as far as I remember, it's second most polluted city in the world. So that's a beautiful combination. And I mean, you need to walk hard to earn all these titles. Um, but when we did our research and we contacted some local people, we realized that this place was just teeming with great photographers and great writers who somehow found inspiration in this. Okay, here we go in this uh, brutal weather and absolutely grim landscapes. They were, they were discovering their surroundings by uh, trying to find some beauty and harmony in, uh, in something that is often missing in their life. And I mean, just look at these pictures, you will realize that uh, Game of Thrones just pales in comparison. It's absolutely stunning. And now we're thinking about organizing an exhibition based on this uh, photography in London later on. So that's another story, it has a completely different vibe. 
Uh, and it tells a very important message, which is that hyperlocal media and media in general are perfectly capable of not only reflecting the physical reality, but also transforming the reality. This is an editorial team of a project which is called Downtown. It's a hyperlocal blog, uh, which is based in Voronezh, and total agricultural backwater, 500 miles away from Moscow. And uh, those guys, mainly local bloggers and local photographers, they were so terrified and depressed with the regional media, which is largely controlled by the local authorities in Russia, so they decided to launch their own platform. So they, they've launched uh, a beautifully created blog with uh, uh, stories that they found that they thought were relevant for, for their peers and for their audience. And instead of creating yet another beautiful blog, they've actually created a cultural movement because uh, this website became some sort of a social network for all the local creatives. And now they, these guys are uh, doing many uh, amazing things. They've organized a bunch of music and theater festivals. Now they're very, pretty much into street foods. Um, they started promoting running around the city and they even uh, organized a competition of barbershops. So that's the, last, that's the, that's the final frontier, basically. Um, so, so the good news is that such projects exist in almost every major regional center, and they are a very important force for good. Uh, I think I'm kind of running off time, so uh, I won't be speaking much about the next story, which takes place in Novosibirsk. Just to give you a hint, it involves uh, a small electronic music record label and uh, which distributes its music on 3D printed, 3D printed cassettes. That's a bit bizarre. Uh, so the next story. Igor, uh, Igor, feel free, you have time. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. It's good to know, yeah. Uh, but I always covered everything, actually. Uh, so this story is, takes place in Yekaterinburg uh, and it's about, it's about protest movements and street art. And we all know and respect brave girls from Pussy Riot, don't we? But at the same time, there are so many other people who practice radical performance art on the streets of Russian cities. And one of them is called Timofey Rade, and he lives in Yekaterinburg. So watch this video, which, you, which will show you um, one of his latest installation called Stability, in a reference to the uh, political regime, uh, which is often portrayed in the state-controlled media as the era of stability. Well, you got the point. Uh, so, Timothy Rady did a lot of other crazy things. He painted snow red in the city center of Yekaterinburg. He drew dominoes on the uh, crumbling bridge in the city center to draw attention to the problems of underfunded public infrastructure. He turns uh, most of the public buildings in the city into works of art. And Timothy Rady is not alone. Uh, his example shows how creatives uh, in Russia are expressing their anger and resistance to the bleak political environment by connecting to each other on the internet and drawing and turning this anti-inspiration into powerful creative messages. And we want to give them a voice. We want them to be heard much louder around the world. We want them to be part of the international uh, creative landscape. Uh, and to do that, by the way, this is Timothy Rady himself in front of this bridge. To do that, we've recently teamed up uh, with The Guardian's New East Network, and as a result of this partnership, more than 25 of our main stories ended up on the front page of The Guardian. Uh, and this is amazing, this is astonishing. Imagine what a journey from the outskirts of Norilsk 
to millions of readers around the world in just two steps. And I think that this is very important and it just shows that uh, the whole notion of distance is nothing but a pure aberration in the, world, in the world of interconnected online communities. Being far right now is actually not an obstacle, it's your advantage. You can be a photographer in Norilsk uh, and then get republished on the cover journal and on the following day appear on the front page of The Guardian. It's actually that simple. And we believe that, uh, and I believe personally, that this is great and this is good because this is exactly where we'll see the biggest and the brightest explosion of talent and creativity in the foreseeable future. Uh, not only in places like Berlin or Barcelona or London, but also in places like Ulan Ude, in places like Yekaterinburg, in Karachi and Batumi, in Kiev and Lvov. Uh, and I want to say that, um, yeah, I just want to say that this is great. So tune up your radar, watch this place, and in the meantime, I'm booking my train tickets to Ulan Ude, so feel free to join me on this ride. Thank you.